Hello, my name is Jason Chanko. I'm an applications engineer for Regal Technologies, and today we're going to be covering conducted emissions and pre-compliance. We're going to try to cover a little bit of conducted emissions, uh, how you can use a spectrum analyzer to give you some more information about your designs, as well as where you can uh, make some changes and uh, help you to pass that, uh, that ever important compliance for conducted emissions. Uh, as many of you may be aware, conducted emissions are emissions that from the instrument or uh, the device that you happen to be uh, manufacturing or designing that uh, the EMI or electromagnetic interference that may be transmitted up the power line back into the power grid. Uh, and each country has its own set of limits, um, but in this particular demo we're just going to stick to the FCC uh, subpart 15 requirements and uh, just use those as a, as a baseline. And again, I'm going to be stepping through a lot of the procedures with one of our spectrum analyzers, the DSA-815. Uh, and uh, I also am using some other instrumentation, which we'll have a, a diagram of briefly here. And you can see in this slide that we have the equipment under test, the phase neutral and ground connected through of the power cord to the listen. We also have the horizontal ground reference plane and vertical ground reference plane. Those are going to be conductors that are going to be bonded together that are at least two times the area of the equipment under test, and that helps to isolate the equipment under test from capacitively coupling to anything in the room. Uh, and then you also have the listen connected through the AC mains, as well as uh, through a connection to the EMI receiver and spe or spectrum analyzer. In this case, that's the DSA-815. And here we have the physical setup for our measurement. We have the equipment under test located on an insulating wood table that's separated by 800 millimeters from our listen, which is going to be placed on the horizontal ground plane. It's also going to be electrically connected to the horizontal ground plane or uh, bonded. The vertical ground plane is going to be 400 millimeters away from the listen and also electrically bonded to the horizontal ground plane. Again, typically those are plates of aluminum or copper, and uh, they are two times the surface area of the equipment under test. In that, uh, in that particular profile. We also are going to want the EMI receiver or spectrum analyzer to be off of the horizontal ground plane located a, a distance away. Uh, it's typically in the next room or, or away from the equipment under test. We basically want to minimize any capacitive coupling that we may have and any interference from other equipment that we might have with the uh, EMI receiver and the equipment under test. Again, we want, using the listen, the idea is that we want to just read the conducted emissions coming out from the equipment under test. Before we begin, I would like to briefly cover a bit about pre-compliance. Uh, many, uh, many of these countries that you're going to be distributing your products within uh, have, have a set of standards and also a set of measurement procedures. Uh, currently, CISPR, or CISPIR 16, uh, is the widely accepted standard for the test procedure and the test instrumentation for these types of tests. Uh, basically, the rule book that, allow, that tells you exactly what uh, the physical layout and the instrumentation configurations need to be in order to be a compliant measurement. Uh, those are the standards by which you will be measured uh, ultimately. So pre-compliance is really an idea. Uh, it, it will give you better insight into your designs and it will get you close to compliance. But each individual setup is going to be different and you'll, you really need to measure or test your setup versus the uh, golden standard, as it were, of a, of a fully compliant setup. And there are many third-party independent laboratories that have full compliant setups if you would uh, like to get some uh, verification in, in that particular way. But you can use your data, compare it to a, a third-party uh, standard data from, the, from that testing that exact same instrument and use that as a, as a factor in your future designs. So you can get a really good idea or understanding of where you currently are, uh, where your measurement setups are a little bit uh, deficient or different than those of the, uh, the golden standard. And those are fairly linear and you can apply those in the f with future designs. That being said, now we can move a little bit uh, closer to our actual application here. Um, first of all, I'd like to describe the uh, the setup. All right, uh, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll show a diagram here in a second. But what we're going to have is we have a spectrum analyzer. We have a ground plane, a horizontal ground plane, a vertical ground plane, and I'll have a diagram of those in a second. And we're using a listen, which is a uh, an instrument, or um, it's an instrument used to isolate the device that you are testing from the mains that are coming in, the mains power. It's also known as an artificial mains. Uh, and we'll show a diagram of that in a moment as well. And it basically allows you to 
measure the conducted emissions down the power line of your device under test through the spectrum analyzer without any interference from the surrounding environment or the mains. And, uh, and so we'll have a quick diagram of the physical setup and the instrumentation here in a moment. Uh, now we're going to focus a little bit more on the setup of the spectrum analyzer. So the first thing that we're going to do is configure the spectrum analyzer to just set up uh, or get it set up for making our measurements today. Uh, we're going to enable the EMI filter. So that's in the BW detect and you'll see that we have Gaussian uh, and then EMI. The, with the DSA-815, the EMI filter is an option. Uh, it's part of the EMI part number DSA-800 EMI kit. Um, and then we're also going to then change the resolution bandwidth. Many of these measurements, especially, uh, well, many of the measurements, the resolution bandwidth, or let's say the resolution of each measurement, is made at a given setting, and that is dependent on the frequency range that you're going to be looking at. For this particular setup, we're going to look at 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, and the resolution bandwidth prescribed in FCC subpart 15 for that band is 9 kilohertz for the RBW. So we're going to go up to the RBW here, and we'll push in uh, 9.5 kHz. And so now uh, it's going to take quite a bit of time because we started from factory defaults. We're going over a gig and a half at 9 kilohertz. That's going to take a little bit of time. So uh, again, we are only going to test 150 kilohertz to 300 megahertz. So now I'm going to press the frequency key and uh, go to start frequency. Again, 150K. And then we're going to stop at 30 meg, so we'll go 30 megahertz. So now you can see we're scanning quite, quite nicely. So now I'd like to show you how to change the units. Uh, many times these, uh, these compliance tests are performed in different types of units than DBM, which is uh, the default for this particular spectrum analyzer. You can press the amplitude key, go to units. We're going to put this into volts. And now we're going to configure a limit line. Again, this is optional. You don't need to have this, but it's nice to, uh, to be able to have a limit on the top of the display that will show you what, uh, how close you are as far as or how close your device under test is to that given limit line for the particular standard that you're going to be looking at. To enable the limit lines with this particular instrument, we're going to press the uh, trace PF key, and then we're going to go down to the pass fail key. We'll enable the pass-fail line, and now you'll see we have a dark purple line and we have a light blue line. Now with this particular instrument, there's an upper line and a lower line. We're going to only work with the upper line at this particular point in time. And you'll see now, now there's a table down below that shows some of the points that we have available. And we can edit those points. We can go to Setup, and then we can go to Edit. And we need two points for a line. In this case, we're going to be running from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz. So our first point is going to be at X, which is 150. And again, that was kHz. And then point two is going to be at 30 mega or yeah, 30 megahertz. And then our amplitude is going to be one millivolt. In this particular case, we're going to do the FCC subpart 15 for digital radiators, which is a one millivolt limit over this particular band. Uh, and I forgot to do the other part. So we'll go back and we will do, uh, that was one millivolt. And then we'll go to point two and connect them. And here we'll connect them. And now you'll see the purple line has dropped and now we're at the one millivolt. All right, now we're going to configure the detector type and bandwidth detector in this area here, and we're going to take a look at the detector type. With the, this particular spectrum analyzer, we have a number of available options for our detector type. What we're going to do, because it's a very fast test, we're going to use positive peak for the initial scan over the, over the range, the frequency range of interest, and then we're going to recognize which points are going to be difficult, uh, which points are close to that that limit line, and then we're going to perform a more uh, a more serious or detailed analysis using a different detector to get uh, much more uh, information available. The positive peak is always going to give us the worst case value. It's not going to give us a false reading, but it's going to give us the worst case scenario 
Um, again, you don't need to have the EMI filter enabled, and you don't need to use the quasi-peak filter. Again, those are optional. But if you want to get a better understanding or closer data to what you would get in a full compliance configuration, you would want to use the quasi-peak filter, or, I'm sorry, quasi-peak detector and the EMI filter in order to get there. Um, so for this example, the first, first pass, we're going to do positive peak just to give us a worst case scenario over that, over that spectral range. And now we're going to set our attenuator. We go to amplitude. We're going to check and make sure our input attenuation is set to 10 dB. And now that we've configured our uh, uh, we've configured our spectrum analyzer, I'm going to plug in our listen, and I'm going to plug in our listen with no device under test. And basically, I'm going to be testing the cabling and the environment for any stray EMI that we may be picking up, or our conducted EMI that we may be picking up because of the way that we have our cables arranged, or the, uh, the just the physical environment that we're working in. Uh, if you could bear with me, and you'll note we don't have any major peaks. We can also freeze the display or we could store the data to, as a CSV using a USB stick on the front panel. We could store that reference data and then come back to it later to compare it to our, uh, our actual device under test. And in that particular way, we'd be able to then null out any um, environmental effects that we might be seeing. And now that we've nulled out our background readings, we have a, a really good idea of where our background peaks are going to be. Uh, we are now ready to then connect the instrument under test to the listen. So the first thing I'm going to do is disconnect the uh, spectrum analyzer from the listen. The reason that we're going to do this is the device under test, when we plug it in, could draw a lot of current, uh, could cause a lot of transients to come down the power or down the uh, monitoring line to our spectrum analyzer, can damage that front end. So what we want to do is disconnect the spectrum analyzer, plug in the device under test, let it settle, uh, you know, maybe give it a few seconds, 30 seconds or a minute, uh, and then we can plug in the DSA-815. Uh, in many cases, uh, you can use a, what's called a transient limiter that's in the circuit uh, or in the connection between the listen and the front of the spectrum analyzer, uh, and that may also help to protect the front end of the uh, spectrum analyzer. It does depend on what listen model you're using and your device under test characteristics. Okay, so I've disconnected the spectrum analyzer from the listen. I've now connected my device under test to the listen, let it set for a minute or so to let all of the transients and uh, let all the transients settle. And now I'm going to plug in the listen to the DSA. And now you can see that all of a sudden we have some noise coming up at the 150K on that low frequency range. And then we have some high or broadband noise popping up over here. Now what we're going to do is take a, uh, you know, you can either do this by hand or you could, uh, you could automate this and do a data collection process and post-analyze the data later. But basically, I'm going to say, okay, well, I'm going to want to come back to this, to this low frequency range, 150 kilohertz, and do some more analysis. Uh, and then we're going to set up to do that here in a moment. So to get a better idea of what's happening down at that low end, we're going to want to zoom into that particular area. Again, we're, we don't have any other peaks on this particular device under test, although you see that this broadband noise is occasionally coming up very high. Uh, but what you want to do is, again, just make a note of the spectral ranges that you want to do more analysis over, and, uh, and then we're going to use the spectrum analyzer to focus in on those areas. So now you should have a rough idea of the problem areas that you have using that positive peak detector that we were using before, detector type positive peak, that's going to give us the worst case scenario for these, uh, for these measurements. And now we're going to focus in a little bit more. So what we're going to do is uh, change our frequency. Remember, we're going to start at that 150 kilohertz. So we just go to the frequency, and then we're going to put our uh, start frequency at zero, and then our stop frequency we're going to put at 300. And now, again, here's our limit line that we started at 150 kilohertz, but you can see that occasionally we're getting some stuff coming up over the top of that line, over that limit line, so we want to do a little bit more analysis on that. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is make sure that we're not overloading the detector. And uh, so the uh, spectrum analyzer is different than an EMI receiver from the standpoint that it doesn't have a pre-selection input filter. And so it's really, the, the spectrum analyzer is seeing a lot of broadband noise and we very well could be overloading that, that detector. So one method to determine whether you have an overloaded detector or not is to use an, amplifier, or to use an, an input attenuator. 
So we're going to go to the attenuator. Remember we had the input attenuator set to 10 dB. If we set that to 20 dB, and we don't notice any of the peaks changing in their value, we can be more confident that we're not overloading the detector. You'll see that the noise floor ro rose significantly because we have basically dropped the signal to noise ratio. Um, but the uh, input attenuator hasn't changed the peak values significantly. So we didn't see these peak values drop in any, uh, any particular way or rise in any particular way. They basically look the same. So we can feel pretty confident that we uh, haven't overloaded that front detector and we'll go back to that 10 dB and you'll see again we, the peaks didn't change significantly or anything like that. So uh, we can feel uh, that we are making measurements that are, uh, are making sense. But again, we're getting very, very close here to, the, uh, to that limit line, if not exceeding it. And now that we have focused in on our area of concern, or one of our areas of concern, you can see, uh, in this case, we're gonna go from zero to 300 megahertz, I'm sorry, 300 kilohertz, and uh, we're looking for, you can see a number of peaks are popping up, and we're using that positive peak detector. Now that we have worst case scenario with the positive peaks, we wanna get a better idea or more visibility into how close to this line are we uh, in a compliant measurement. So what we'll do is we're going to change over to the quasi-peak detector. The quasi-peak detector is going to take quite a bit longer to run, which is why we don't use it across the entire span of interest because it would just take a very long time for us to perform that test. We use the positive peak detector to give us our troubled areas, then we focus on those troubled areas and use the quasi-peak detector to uh, analyze the data further and get a better idea of how close to that limit line we are or how far above that limit line we are in a, in a compliance standpoint, or from a compliance standpoint. Uh, so you can see, I'm gonna use my finger or a pen, uh, and you can see that we're, as we do the quasi-peak, it, it does take quite a bit longer. It's actually doing some averaging as it goes across. And then as we get to this troubled area, you can see that from a quasi-peak standpoint, we're actually going to be above the line. And uh, that, so that's gonna be an indicator, that's an area that we're gonna want to do a little bit of improvement uh, to make sure, we wanna go back to our designers now and say, hey, uh, we have a peak here, uh, the conduct, we're failing conducted emissions, and um, basically what we can do is get a marker, so press the marker key, we can run that marker down here, and we are uh, peak, and it's fairly broadband. I mean, it's, uh, you know, what are we dealing with here? 300 kilohertz total. So we're dealing with a, a fairly wide, you know, 50 kilohertz span or so. Uh, and we're looking at 218 kilohertz at one and a half millivolts peak. So we're going to want to bring that area down a little bit, maybe with some shielding or a possible redesign. Um, but uh, your engineers are definitely going to want to know that information. And now uh, you can retest the same product with the exact same setup and in this particular uh, fashion we could save this data as a CSV file uh, and then come back to use it later or we can compare any changes that we might have in the future future designs to this older data uh, and be able to compare design changes to the conducted emission lines which will uh, you know the closer you can get to uh, compliant prior to getting your certification or doing self-certification uh, the better you'll be Thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always drop us a line at Regal. Thank you.